we, we have been talking uh, last six weeks, seven weeks actually, about um, Daniel when he was taken from captivity. And, and we, we were talking about how he and the Israelites were taken to Babylon and to, to basically to be missionaries to spread the gospel in Babylon. There was a group of people that needed to hear about God, and God allowed these people to be taken and literally taken as slaves. And, but, but where you go, you're going to share who you are and share what God's put into you. That's what we do. That's what we do. And that's what we do in this world today. Matter of fact, one of the great words in the Bible is the word bond slave, which means freely given as a slave. They would literally sell themselves as slaves so that no matter where they went and whatever the circumstances were, they could be a missionary of the gospel. That's what we're to be. So here we're today, we're going to look at some of the fruit, the future fruit that Daniel and those Israelites, uh, as they planted the seeds in Babylon, we're going to read about how that fruit came about. So if you have a copy of God's Word, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word in Matthew chapter number 2? Let's see what God's Word has to say. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Do you hear that? Not only was Herod troubled, all Jerusalem, instead of celebrating... They were troubled. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, that is Herod, and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and this is the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Did y'all catch that? After this long journey, after they took the detour in Jerusalem, the star led them to the place exactly where the child was. And when they walked in and saw what they were looking for, what they were anticipating, when, the, when, when what they had been doing was literally before them, they fell down and worshipped the one that we call Jesus the Christ. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What a day that must have been. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their country, another way. Bow with me as we pray. Now, Lord, we are grateful for this time that we have together, and we pray that this will not be a time of just coming to church, just simply to come to church. But Lord, be Emmanuel, be with us here. Lord, meet us here and call us to yourself. Lord, as you spoke to those wise men to speak the truth into them and Lead them to see the Savior of the world, where they too could be missionaries of what they had seen and heard and experienced. Father, speak to us personally today. May the Word be real. May it be fresh. May it penetrate into our hearts and our minds and our thoughts. And Lord, may we come with them and bow before You. Fall down humbly before the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of all glory. As you look at us today from heaven, you see us, your word says you know every hair in our head. Lord, you know every thought in our heart. You know where we've been and what we've done and what we're going through. Lord, you also know what we need. 
a word from you. So Lord, we're asking today that you would do what only you can do. Would you speak life and truth into us? Speak and speak love and peace. Lord, may we say when we leave this place that it's been good to be in your presence. And may we leave different than the people that we were when we came. For your honor and glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you be seated, please? This is the story of the wise men. When we sing songs about them today, we may say, we three kings of Orion are, but we not necessarily were there just three. Matter of fact, most likely there were way more than three, probably 15, 20, 30, maybe even as many as 50 that would come together in a caravan, but they get three because of the gifts that were brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we also do not know that they were kings. The word wise men simply is the word magi. It is a Persian word that speaks of those who were given to the, to the greatest education of the day. Their purpose was to serve the kingdom, to serve the king, uh, to serve the rulers, to serve the people by helping them understand the difficulties of life. The word is simply sometimes translated as it was in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 5. It was translated by them uh, simply magicians, if things that they didn't know and they didn't understand, they would study. Where, this is actually the word where we get our word magic from, magi. They were magicians. They were people who studied astrology. By the way, let me just pause here and just say uh, that the study of the stars were created by God and that all of God's creation will point to Him for His glory and honor. But never get all this horoscopes and all that stuff. Don't you think for a half a silly second that that's of God? That's somebody trying to spin the creation of God for their own purpose. I got one amen. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. I appreciate that. But just to understand, they were called counselors. They were called men of wisdom. They even were called soothsayers because they were so unknown things of truth. And they would say, we want to know the things of God. And all of these people saw Daniel as one who brought answers. And because he was one that brought answers, everyone knew. Listen to me now. They knew that Daniel didn't do this simply because he was a wise person, but they knew that he knew God. And when he spoke, he spoke the words of God. Now, in the book of Daniel, we looked at the first six chapters, and on Wednesday nights in the coming year, we're going to take chapter 7 and go on with it. But, but there was much more words of wisdom that Daniel, under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he spoke to the people to tell them about things that were to come. It's really the, to, to behold the mysteries of God. Even the book of Revelation means the, the unveiling of the things of God. And that's really what uh, Daniel was in the Old Testament. Revelation is the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I don't really think you can understand the book of Revelation until you can understand the last part of Daniel. But these people who were seeking after truth, they, they listened to, to Daniel because they knew that he spoke the things of God and they wanted to know the wisdom that were in the world. And, and when they looked at him, they looked and they listened. And this was a work of God that was always calling this people in Babylon to himself. Even Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself and gave himself under God. And by the way, never forget, that's God's greatest desire is to call sinful people to himself to receive a relationship of forgiveness and love and mercy and grace and peace. That we can leave where we are, learn of him now, but leave where we are and be with him and his joy forevermore. That's going to be glory when we are with him that day. It's always been this. And these people heard the things of God and studied them. Never forget that Abraham, who was the father of, of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac had two boys, Jacob and, and, and Esau, Jacob whose name became Israel. Never forget where they come from. As a matter of fact, look in Matthew chapter 1 and look in verse 17. The Word of God says, So all the generations from Abraham to David, King David, are 14 generations. From David to the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. 
and from the captivity in Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. From the beginning, from Abraham who left, who left the Ur of the Chaldees and found himself in the promised land to King David, 14 generations. 14 generations from David till they were taken into captivity in Babylon. 14 generations from the time that they came back until the Christ. These people who would study the things of Daniel, who would study the generations of God, who were studying all wisdom, knew this could be the time. And then the star showed up. Look in verse 2. They came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Church, listen, they were, they were saying, this is the things that we've been studying about. We've been hearing about. We've been learning of. That this great God, in the Old Testament, it was, there's those scriptures they studied too. Maybe they read about Jeremiah. Maybe they read the great script of Isaiah too. And to say, this one who's come to be the Savior of the world, he is coming. We want to go see him. If this is the King, the Son of God, we want to see Him. Many have theories of this star. Some say it was this, some say it was that. Some, some people say that in the year Christ was born, that Jupiter and Saturn were uh, the closest that they've been in all these years, and, and maybe that's what it was. I, I don't know about any of those things. I, I, if I don't know, I'll be the first one to tell you I don't know. But I do know that God has been able to lead His people Remember when the children of Israel left Egypt and they were headed to the promised land and they didn't really know where, which way to go? God sent them a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when that cloud went before them, they followed it. And when it stopped, they stopped. If it was at night and the fire stopped in the sky, they stopped that day. And when it moved, they moved. Now, I'm not saying that this is a pillar of cloud. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying when you have a need, God will lead you. And God got these people attention by a star, a new star that was there. And I don't know how it was, but it was, it was able that they could see it and they could follow it just like the children of Israel did in the wilderness and they followed the cloud that way. And they knew it and they followed it and, and they prepared for this. And they got this caravan together and they traveled in preparation to see the king. And when they got to Jerusalem, they were amazed because they got there and nobody was talking about it. They said, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Where's the new king child? We came to worship him. They didn't know anything about it. They were astounded. And then Herod heard what they were saying. You know, if you don't just walk into Jerusalem, 20, 30, 50 people from, from the, uh, a land to the east and just say, they're not, they can't be inconspicuous. And they, and they saw them and they heard, Herod heard why they came and what they were asking for. And he was troubled and he called them to them. Why are you here? And they told him. So he got the scribes together. The scribes were the people of the law. They, they were the people who would copy the word of God and make sure every jot, every tittle was done, copied correctly. They knew the Word, but they really didn't know the Word. They knew the words, but the words didn't know them. They maybe even could quote it. They quickly said, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it's Bethlehem, that's where the Christ child would come. You know, we sent out a thousand Bibles, but the, the real victory is when they open up the Bible and open up their heart, and they see God and let Him in. And how many of us have, gosh, I can't tell you how many Bibles I have. How many copies of God's Word. And it really doesn't matter how many I have on the bookshelf. Y'all got me? It, much is, it, it doesn't matter how much I have of the Word of God, it's how much the Word of God has me. Right? How many of y'all believe this? Amen. Believe it from beginning to end. Amen. But how many of it are, you're living up to all what you already know? You see, it's not how much you know, it's how much you're living that you know. Amen? 
Now they saw this, they were spurred by this. They went, they, 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 I don't know what their life was like, but they said, it's time to put it on pause. There's something more important. We'll make this long travel. They'll get there. And Herod said, well, let me find out for you. Now, Herod was not what you would call the greatest of guys. His grandfather was named uh, Antipas. Rome appointed his grandfather as the governor over this region. His grandfather died in 78 BC. His father, Julius Caesar, uh, made him a uh, procurator of Judea. His father's name was, was Antipater. And Mark Anthony appointed Herod, they called him Herod the Great, appointed him as Tetrarch of Galilee. And Herod wanted to be loved, and he wanted to rule, and he did many things, many great things. Actually, he refurbished and built onto the temple there in Jerusalem and brought it back to its former splendor, created new walls around it, expanded the city, and everybody thought all those things were great. But Herod was a very scared person. He wanted to be in control, actually to the point that he killed two of his boys and even his own wife because he thought that they may be a threat to his leadership. Herod saw this new king of the Jews as a threat. So he, when he told the wise men, he said, hey, uh, come back and tell me later, when did you first see the star? If you find him, bring him back and let me know so I can come worship him too. We know that that's not really what he wanted to do. But when the wise men left, it says here that um, verse number nine, when they heard the king, they departed and behold the star which they had seen in the east went before them. They left Herod. They're going to go to Bethlehem. And the star is there. Their heart had to start beating again. Could this be? And once again, it was leading them. And it led them to Bethlehem. And look what it says. Till it came and stood over where the young child was. It led them right to that place and stopped. And they said, this must be the place. And they got off and went to the home. Look what it says in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced immediately, exceedingly, with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house and they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, look what it says. What's it say? They fell down and worshipped him. Their heart had to be beating. This is what they hoped for. This is what they longed for. It led them right to that place. And when they walked in, it's exactly what they thought. They saw the mother. They saw the baby and said, this is the Christ child. And when you See the Word of God come alive. And the prompting of the Holy Spirit is there with exceeding joy. Out of love and desire, they humbled themselves and they fell down and worshipped Him. The word worship means to bow down. Bow down physically, but bow down in your heart. Yield to. There's something amazing here. There's something so wonderful here. You know, on the night of Jesus' birth, the shepherds heard the angels sing. And they went at night to the place, the manger, where Jesus was born. And when they did, they got up and they were, they were so exceedingly glad. And the Bible says they went everywhere there sharing what they had seen and what they heard. Now, the wise men are there. And, it, and they're, they're blessed by this, and they've been changed by this. And they respected, and a spark went off in their heart. They discovered their king. Words cannot describe what they were saying here when they exceeding joy. Unless you've met Christ. You remember when you met Christ? Gave Him your heart and life? I know I've told you this story so many times, but it's my story and it's my testimony, and i got to tell it. When I was that 10-year-old child, and I felt like my chest was going to explode, and I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I needed to do, but it felt like something was holding me back, but I felt like I had a 1,000 pounds on my shoulders, but, but I, I just said, I've got 
to give my heart and life to Christ. And I stepped out and I walked down to the aisle and I went with tears and I went with anxiety and I went with, felt like, felt like I was going to explode, but I, I got up off my knees and I had met the Savior and the burdens had been lifted. The, the weight was gone. All the heaviness was gone and it, there was joy. I, I tell you what, I was smiling from ear to ear. I felt like I had gotten wired up and ready to go. I was 10 years old and I was a boy and I was all full of energy, but I know I bounced all over that place. I remember getting back in the car. Uh, I had to sit in the back seat, amen? Mom and dad were in the front seat and I was in between them right in her ear and I was so excited and telling them, I said, I just can't wait to go to school. They knew something was up then when Brian was, couldn't wait to get to school. And I, I said, I want to go tell my friends what God has done to me. I had exceedingly great joy in my heart. You know, some of us, we've gotten over what it was like when we got saved. We've gotten over what it was like to be filled with the peace and the joy and the love of God. We should never lose that. We should cherish that. That's the gold right there. To know God and to be known by God. To know that God knows everything about you. They say that character is what you are when nobody else is looking, but God sees you all the time. He knows every thought. He has plans of good for you, for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God wants to bless you, but God wants you to be a blessing. God wants to put so much of his love and joy in you that you can't help but let it out so that all the world can see we're all called to be missionaries. Missionaries go the testimony of what God has done for us. And when they found themselves in the presence of the King of Kings, they worshiped him there. And it says, and they brought to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold. That's the, the medal of kings, it's called. William Barclay. And his commentary on the book of Matthew says it this way, and I quote him, It was the custom in Persia that no one could approach a king without a gift, and gold was appropriate. When they left, their desire was to go meet the new king. So they got prepared, and they took their treasure, and they put it in gold. For the sole purpose of bringing that which a king deserved, they brought their very best to lay before the king of kings. And by the way, we should give God our best. There are too many that give God the leftovers. There are too many that, that want to give God a tithe of their love when he gave us all of our love, all of his love. And we should come back and we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. And if we're going to do that, we might as well love the ones that He loves and treat our neighbor the way that we want to be treated. And do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And God puts us around situations and circumstances that are not easy. Matter of fact, He tells us to love our enemy. Not because we waged war on them, most likely because they waged war on us and they want to pour poison on us and anger on us and bitterness on us. But we're supposed to give love and light. We're not to give, we're not supposed to do unto others as they do unto us. No, 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 no. So much more. Matter of fact, that's the miracle. That's the miracle, is, is the grace of God that He gave us and the grace of God that He gives through us. Giving God our very best. One of the greatest witnesses of the glory of God is the love and the light that He puts in us. One of the worst witnesses is the sourpusses. Y'all know those Christians that are always angry and mad that He can get their way? Things that and just the way that they want it, and they're going to let the world know. I mean, it's like they took their devil pill that morning, and that's what they got to give. That doesn't 
that doesn't bring anybody to God. Matter of fact, how many times have we talked to people who say, if that's what a Christian is, I don't have anything to do with it. But yet, if we could humble ourselves before the Holy One, and we could recognize that He is the only reason why we have anything, and one day I'm going to breathe my last breath here and I'm going to breathe my first breath there. And all the joy that I have down here on earth will be multiplied a trillion times over, a trillion times a trillion times a trillion when I step into the presence of the glory of God and I find the love that I have down here, but I find it pure there. And the joy that I have down here was just a, 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 a glimpse of the glory that I will have there. Bring the gold. Bring the best. And lay it down in front of him. Some scholars have said that most likely, you know, God always provides ahead of time. It, 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 most likely God wanted these wise men to come and bring the gold because after they would leave, uh, the wise men would be warned uh, to go a different way home and not tell Herod. And then Joseph would be warned in a dream not to go back to Nazareth, but, but to go to Egypt and stay there. And they would need funds to provide for them along the way. I'm going to say it again. God always provides. He always provides. You'll never see a child of his begging bread. God will always take care of his own. But not only gold, frankincense, the incense of worship, the most fragrant aroma, a fragrant, beautiful, pleasing offering unto God. It would be used in the Temple worship, when the, the, not the sin offering, no. The sin offering would be an animal that would, be, that would come and be burnt and the smell of flesh would be smelled so that you would know the cost of your redemption. But the, the, the peace offering would be meal mixed with frankincense and the smell, the joy. Like our life when the peace of God comes within us, we should be a sweet-smelling fragrance unto God that He can just look at us, see our desires to love and worship Him and just soak it in and take it up. You know, one of my greatest desires is to put a smile on His face. And how I receive His goodness and His love and His joy and how I live in obedience to Him. That He would look at me and He would say, child, well done. Well done. An offering of holiness. An offering of peace. An offering of love. As a matter of fact, this is what the high priest would take. A fragrance of purity as Jesus is our high priest who comes and this fragrant gift was used to point to the priestly work of redemption in us. Gold, the medal of kings, frankincense, the incense of worship, and myrrh, the gift of death. It does sound kind of odd for a baby to be born and to bring him myrrh. Myrrh was anointment that was used in the embalming of a dead body. The dead body would be lathered up. As a matter of fact, when Jesus died on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea had a, a tomb that had never been uh, used nearby. He asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, the same Nicodemus that you know of John chapter 3, was there to help Joseph of Arimathea. And Nicodemus took a hundred pounds of the ointment myrrh and put upon the body of Christ. Literally, when the wise men came, they brought him gold for a king to the incense to be worshipped, but they also brought the smell of death because that is the gospel that God sent his son into this world to live a pure and a holy life and be willing to go to the cross to offer Himself up as the burnt offering for us, to shed His blood so that we could be redeemed from our sins. Never get over that. Never miss out on that. That is the Gospel story. He gave His life for us. And they laid Him in the tomb, but on Resurrection Sunday, He came back to life. 
Because death could not keep him down. Death needed to be defeated so that he could come and give us life and give it more abundantly. That he could seal our souls for today and forever. That he could write our name down in the Lamb's book of life with his blood that has no eraser at all. That Satan can't get to us. Satan can't defeat us because we're overcomers, because we're held in the hand of the Almighty God. He came to give life. But to give life, he had to give death so he could give us eternal life. The smell of death from the very beginning. Even when he was baptized by John the Baptist, he went out in the wilderness to be tested so that he could show that he was the pure one. Even when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were telling him there, it's time, it's the last lap of the journey. It's time to put your eyes and your gaze towards Jerusalem. You must go and become the offering. In the Garden of Gethsemane the night before the cross, he prayed with sweat drops of blood coming from his brow, saying, my God, If there's any way this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. He lived for us. He died for us so that we could live with him. The glory of the gospel, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they got up and went home different. Travel back, missionaries of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Come back to be with family. It was a good trip. Did you see what you wanted to see? Oh, let me tell you. The most beautiful child. The very very glory of God was there. God's got a plan. I've seen him. God's got victory, and He wants us to have it. As Daniel was 14 generations before, they became the missionaries for the new generation, just as you and I are to be missionaries right here where God's planted us. Yes, we will send Bibles to our community. Yes, we will do all that we can to send gospel tracts with those Samaritans' purse all around the world, and they will go exactly to the place that God wants them. You are part of that. You are part of that. But every day we get the opportunity to bring praise and glory from Him to Him. So what can we learn from this? Number one, there is no effort that's too great when you're seeking Jesus. There may be cost in it, but just understand there was cost to Christ. And I guarantee you the words that we will hear from His mouth when we see Him in glory is it was worth it all. Never let any effort come in the way between you and seeking Christ. Can I say it this way? Give Him your best. Give Him your very best. Number two, When the wise men came, they didn't know what to find, so they were open to hear information. How many people today aren't willing to listen, aren't willing to hear? But these people, here's the word, they humbled themselves. And God even allowed an ugly, mean Herod, who would go on to kill every child, two years and younger. But God would even use him to help them in their journey. We can learn, folks. We can listen. We can grow. Maybe you're not there yet, but are you headed in the right direction? Number three, their worship was extravagant. They gave God their best. They didn't hold back. I mean, just give your all unto Him. You can't outgive God. Just let yourself be extravagant for Him. 
So many people live their life with a closed hand and God can't take anything out. God can't put anything in. But we just need to come and say, here I am with all my heart, with all my life, with all that is within me, I, I come to worship and serve you. Number four, when they left, they were never the same. They were never the same. I don't know. I just got an unbelievable imagination. I just wonder how many times on their travels back home, they just got overwhelmed with joy and the tears started flowing. Just remembering what they had seen and how they were different, how they were changed. How long has it been since you had tears flow from your face because of the goodness of God? How long has it been since you've been broken in worship and you, you, it's not just that you fell to your knees. You couldn't get up because you did, you just wanted to continuously praise him. He deserves your best. Let your worship be extravagant. We're not the same. And they took Jesus wherever they went. Wherever they went. Wednesday night, I'm going to be sharing about how Paul said that God opened up a great door for him there at, in, in Asia Minor to share the gospel. And then in the same sentence, he said, and there's much affliction. God gave them an open door of sharing the gospel. But in the same framework, he put difficult circumstances so that they wouldn't trust in themselves, so that people could see the purity of God. Why would he do anything different in our lives? I understand you have difficulties. I understand you have hardship. I understand you've gone through pain. I understand there are things that you don't understand. I understand how you wish you could erase some of the things that you've done, but that's okay. God loves you, God forgives you, and God wants to take you where you are and use you for his kingdom's glory. For you. For me, for his kingdom's glory. Wise men always seek Jesus. I pray that we will be wise today.